on today's story beat. They were one of the few bands in Liverpool who were writing their own songs. I mean, I heard them, and Bernadette will have heard them do things like I Saw Standing There and um, Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, All My Loving, a lot of songs that they were writing. The other bands weren't writing their own songs. So the Beatles were mixing the rock and roll with their own songs. And that, that's what made them stand out. This is Story Beat with Steve Cuton, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuton. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My guest today, Mike Byrne, created the Beatles Story Exhibition in Liverpool in 1990 with his wife, Bernadette, who was a Cavern Club regular who knew the Beatles well in the early years and became one of the first official Beatles guides in Liverpool. Mike was a fellow Mersey Beat musician who went on to work in marketing, theater, and promotions. He saw the huge potential of Beatles tourism through what Bernadette was doing as a guide and became the manager of Beatles City, an ill-fated exhibition of memorabilia, which he took on tour to Dallas, Texas in 1987. Mike was determined that Liverpool would have its own permanent Beatles exhibition, but found the Liverpool Tourism Board apathetic. Mike and Bernadette realized they would have to do it themselves, eventually raising funding. Creating the exhibition presented a multitude of challenges and hurdles, not least of which was securing permission from the Beatles. Their vision was to create an immersive experience that conveyed the feelings and emotions of key periods in the Beatles' career. They wanted people to see it, hear it, and feel it. The result was 18 different features, including a replica cavern club, a street in Hamburg, an interactive yellow submarine with an octopus's garden. The exhibition has had over 5 million visitors to date and is the most successful Beatles exhibition in the world. They've written a book about their lives and the creation of the exhibition called The Birth of the Beatles Story, which I've read and can tell you is a fascinating deep dive into the early years of the Beatles and how the exhibition in Liverpool came into being. So for all those reasons and many more, I'm truly delighted to welcome the musician, marketer, promoter, and author, Mike Byrne, to Story Beat today. Mike, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Steve, and thank you for having me. It's my great pleasure, believe me. All right, so let's go back in time, even well before the Beatles. When did your interest in music and rock and roll and playing as a musician, when did that begin for you? Well, on the musician side, I ended up in hospital when I was nine, ten years old after a, quite a serious accident um, where I ended up under a coal lorry losing the use of my left hand. Under a coal lorry? How'd that happen? Again, it was snowing and I was... <laughs> I was sliding down runways and dived into the road. And a coal lorry just went over my hand. Oh, ow. I lost my thumb. So I'm in hospital. Um, and after the first trauma and the, you know, the, the, the first many uh, fewer operations, my granddad was in what they called a concert party in Liverpool. Um, which which was a, a group of musicians and singers and people who went and lit, lit, lit. and he he brought me a, a harmonica into the hospital and I started playing the harmonica and I got quite good at it. I think I drove I drove the rest of the patients uh, probably made them more ill, but I kept playing the harmonica, you know. Anyway, so that was when I was ten or eleven, and I and I had a pretty good voice. I was in the school choir and things like that. But the, the um, pivotal moment was for me was 19, 1956. We, we had a radio station uh, called Radio Luxembourg. And every Sunday night, there was a DJ who played rock and roll. And I heard Elvis's Heartbreak Hotel. And that was like the moment for me, 1956. Oh my God, what's this sound? 
Heartbreak Hotel. That's what I want to do. Did you want to be Elvis? I wanted to be Elvis. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was uh, 56. Well, how old was I? 50? Oh, I don't know. I was 13, 14. And I just, oh, wow, wow. And so I started my own little band in school. I was in a, a school, um, a couple of mates, one of them played guitar, one was a singer. I played a bit of piano badly. And and so we, we had a little band and we were doing Elvis stuff and uh, Conway Twitty, It's Only Make Believe and Buddy Holly. Yeah, that, that, that were my influences and that's how I started. And you were doing covers. You were not creating new songs, yes? Uh, unfortunately, well, I, no, no, I, we were doing covers um, until my first band, um, which was an amateur, we weren't pro, um, it was called Mike and the Thunderbirds. Okay. Uh, and we, um, the guitarist, Rod, and I one day did sit down and said, let's try and write some songs. And we did. Mm. We, we, wrote, um, we wrote a song called Web of Love. and we wrote an instrumental called uh, Guitar Española. <laughs> and we did. We recorded them at the same recording studio that the Beatles recorded That'll Be The Day. Oh, wow. So before, before they became famous, they'd gone into this studio. It was called Phillips, not, not the big Phillips label in London. Uh, Phillips in Kensington, Liverpool. And uh, so the Beatles... Quarrymen, Quarrymen had gone in and done that would be the day, and then only no, I didn't know that at the time, uh, and we went in and recorded these two originals. So yes, we did, we did do a couple of originals, but I'm not, I'm not a serious songwriter. I tried over the years to write songs, and they they come out pretty bad. <laughs> well, that's a good clue. If you think they come out bad, then that's a problem. Yeah. You were coming up through the music lifestyle, I guess it would be, in Liverpool at the time, right around the exact same time as the Beatles were coming up, when they were the Quarrymen yeah. and then so on. Yes, I would I would say that they were probably a year, two years ahead of me um, in, you know, in progressive, in, in learning and, and uh, I, I suppose, experience. They were that that bit ahead of me. Um, I came up through the skiffle. We all we all did the skiffle thing. Um, at, the, at the end of my road, we had a an, what they, an air raid shelter, which had been built in the war. And every Friday night, we would go to the air raid shelter, there'd be guitars, and we would be singing skiffle songs. And, and our famous skiffle guy was a guy called Lonnie Donegan, you know, and uh, he, he influenced probably every aspiring guitarist. At what point did you and probably everybody else in Liverpool recognize that there was something special about these four guys called the Beatles? Oh, that, that it would be probably um, a year or two years after they became the, the early Beatles themselves. You know, it was Stuart Sutcliffe was still with the Beatles when I first saw them. And then, then we heard they were gone going to to Germany. Um, I was beginning to go to the Cavern Club then, and all the other clubs because, I, as I say, my my band, Mike and the Thunderbirds, we were we were a covers band. You know, we were doing the Shadows and Elvis and Buddy Holly. Um, but the then, but I would be I saw the Beatles nearly every week. Once, once the Cavern Club started the lunchtime sessions, not evening, the lunchtime sessions, they were five days a week, and they presented all the best bands in Liverpool. You've got to remember, Steve, Liverpool had about 350 groups. We didn't call them bands, we were groups then. That's, that's amazing. I didn't realize you had 350 of them. 350 groups playing in Liverpool and Merseyside, the area. And no other city, I would say, in the world, never mind England, no other city had that many groups. So there was a lot of competition. Um, and I I was fortunate. I, I, I had a day job then. I worked for my dad. But my, dad, my dad's shop was 150 yards from the cabin. So lunch times, I could leave my dad's shop, walk down the road, and I'm in the cavern within five minutes. And I would see Jerry and the Pacemakers, the Searchers, 
the swinging blue jeans, the Mersey Beats, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes, and of course the Beatles. But you know, my, my first group, the first group that I liked the best was Rory Storm and the Hurricanes. Mm -hmm. At that time, at in 1960, Rory Storm and the Hurricanes were bigger than the Beatles. And did you eventually play with them? I I was backed by them in a talent competition. <laughs> we have a big um, holiday camp near Liverpool called Butlins. And these were massive. And Rory and the Hurricanes had a residency there, uh, three summers running. And so I would go down there as this 16-year-old with my Elvis haircut and I would sing with them. So R Ringo Starr backed me when I was singing a whole lot of shaking going on. And he was, was he called Ringo then? He was called Ringo Starr time. And what, what was Rory, as I say, Rory was a bigger band than um, the Beatles then. Uh, they, they did again, mostly, mostly covers, mostly American covers. But Ringo was featured. He, he stood out even then. This is 1960. He stood out as a personality drummer amongst all the other drummers in Liverpool. He, he stood out because in the middle of Rory's set, Rory would stop and go, ladies and gentlemen, it's Ringo Star time. And Rory would leave the stage. The spotlight would be on Ringo and Ringo would sing. Um, he, he was, you know, he liked the country stuff. So he would do um, Carl Perkins's Matchbox. And the other one he did was the Shirelles Boys. Those two songs were on the Beatles' first album. And did people recognize that he had superior time as a drummer than most other drummers? Yes, they did, yeah. Yeah, because he had personality. I mean, he was funny. You know, he was a funny guy. He was always larking around. He was having a laugh. Um, and I think that's what appealed to the Beatles, you know, when, when they changed drummers. They, they knew Ringo from Liverpool, obviously, but they also knew him from Hamburg because they Rory played in Hamburg, Beatles played in Hamburg at the same time. So Ringo would get up with the Beatles in Liverpool. He'd play with the Beatles in Hamburg. They knew Ringo and they knew his personality. It's interesting, you know, art in general, if you talk about painters or composers and so on over time there seems to be some kind of a confluence of activity of, among artists in a certain place that then generates so much of this amazing innovation and that's what happened in liverpool is what you're talking about like it happened in paris with artists and so on that that, that liverpool was a hub for this kind of uh, new thinking and new way to play and so on and clearly what came out of it was a lot of great stuff, including the Beatles, obviously. Exactly. That's what exactly what happened. Because being so many bands in Liverpool, and a lot with diff different styles, you know, there was many different styles. We had a very big country and Western scene in Liverpool. We had a, a kind of a blues scene. We had a big jazz scene, um, a really good jazz scene, because the Cavern Club was a jazz seller before it became a beat seller. Um, we also had uh, some good rhythm and blues groups, the Roadrunners, which I joined event eventually. Um, so, so you had all these bands playing a different type of music. That it was incredible that, and the clubs were jammed. You know, Steve, the clubs were jammed all the time. Not not just at the weekends. Midweek, we had all night sessions. We, you know, we have our famous ferries on the Mersey, and there were there were all night sessions on the ferries. It sounds like the energy was amazing. Whatever was in the air, it was very energetic. <laughs> yeah, you're you're right. It was in the air. <laughs> so Bernadette, who you everybody calls Bernie, right? Bernie, yeah. Okay, so what, Bernie eventually has a close relationship to the Beatles. Yes. Oh yes, she does. Yes. So while I'm while I'm you know trying to be a better musician with my band Mike and the Thunderbirds, and then then I turn professional with them Grimbles. Um, Bernie at the same time was going to the cabin, same time as me. Um, she had a favourite place in the cabin, which was the first arch, um, which was about three feet from the stage, and of course 
she eventually the Be the Beatles became her favourite band. I mean, she, she she originally went to see other Liverpool bands like Farron's Flamingos, The Big Three, um, but on the same bill one night was the Beatles, and she she went, oh my god, they look different, you know, because they had the leather jackets and the cowboy boots, and and they they had a kind of an attitude on stage. They were funny. I mean, John, John Lennon was a comedian in his own way, you know. Sure, and, sure. And very sarcastic, but he was f funny. And it, he would skip the audience, you know. Paul, Paul was the charmer, um, and Pete, Pete was just the quiet one at the back, providing the beat, you know. And George was also quite quiet because he was the youngest. But John and Paul, they were the personalities. And I think, I think Bernadette, she, you know, she eventually got to know them because when you were in the cabin the cabin was very, very small as I say her seat which she tried to get every time she went was three feet from the stage they would know her that you know that the, the Beatles and the other bands knew, knew knew the girls by name you know so they'd shout hey Bernie that's you know and she'd shout up sing long tall Sally you know and um, and they would, and they'd do requests and things like that. And in the breaks, Bernie could go up to the, she could go to the coffee bar. The lads would be at the coffee bar, so they'd be chatting. And all the girls, it, it was, it was like a social club. It was a, it, everybody knew each other at the time. And eventually, you know, George apparently, well, no, it wasn't. It was Paul first asked her for a date. Well, what would happen, you see, they would get lifts home. You know, after after the shows, the girls would go to the bus stop, the bands would get in their cars or their vans and they'd drive past the bus stop. And um, I think one night Paul stopped and picked Bernadette up. John was in the car as well. And they, they, dropped, they dropped Bernie's friend off first. Then they took, took Bernie home. And John just said to Bernie... He said, Paul will pick you up tomorrow night. <laughs> and she said, oh, you can't. Uh, I don't get home till six. And then John apparently said, well, he's not asking you to marry him. <laughs> so anyway, they arranged the date, you know, and, and Paul, Paul picked her up the next night and took her to the pictures. And then after the pictures, they went back to Rory's house. You know, because Rory's house was an open house, you know. Uh, so they'd go after gigs. So they went, so Bernadette went back to Rory's house and uh, George was there and Rory was there and probably some other groups. And it was snowing, apparently. And so they all left at the same time. And George grabbed hold of Bernadette from the back and they both fell over. In the snow, <laughs> she said, Paul gave George a bit of a dirty look. I was like, <laughs> oh, you silly boy. Um, so that was the last time that Paul took her out. But George then gave her a, put a note through her door saying, Bernadette, give me a call. Wow. And that started Bernadette's, you know, dating George. And that, that lasted on and off for a year in 1962 through to 1963. Wow. There are a couple of really cool pictures in the book of Bernadette sitting at the stage's edge in the Cavern Club as the Beatles play. It's really neat to look at. That, that picture is uh, is quite iconic, really. And um, it's used in, it's been used over the years by newspapers all over the place. And, of course, because Bernadette went out with George, some some journalists, of course, have found out and they they get in touch with her. And one article called her the Beat Bird. The Beat Bird. Who <laughs> went out with two Beatles. But that intimacy at the cavern was typical of the time. Would you say that back then you thought to yourself, they're going somewhere? That they're going to make it somehow. Yes, yes, that was that went through my mind probably in the beginning of nineteen sixty-two. 
Um, they'd made their first record. Brian Epstein had be- come onto the scene and he had gone around all the record companies with their tapes. And eventually, of course, George Martin said, yep, let's get them down. And they did Love Me Do. And they were one of the few bands in Liverpool who were writing their own songs. I mean, I heard them and Bernadette will have heard them do things like I Saw Us Standing There and... Um, Love Me Do, P.S. I Love You, All My Loving, a lot of songs that they were writing. The other bands weren't writing their own songs, so the Beatles were mixing the rock and roll with their own songs, and and that's what made them stand out. And the other thing that made them stand out was after the third time they came back from Germany, they they were in full leathers. You and many people will know the story of when they were in Germany at Star Club, Astrid Kirscher and Klaus Vormann were coming to see them, and they they were wearing black all the time, and they were wearing the black leathers, and the, but black leather trousers, and we'd never seen black leather trousers before, you know, and and uh, this time they came back from Germany, and I, I saw them at a place called Aintree Institute, which was one of the other clubs in Liverpool, and they'd just come back from Germany the night before, they were in full leather jackets, black T-shirts, black leather trousers, and they just had this amazing attitude on stage. Oh, and by the way, it was the first time they had the haircuts. You know, the beetle cut? The beetle cut. Yes, because because Klaus Vormann or Astrid had cut John's hair. No, not John's, of course, not John's. Stuart's hair. Um, yeah, Astrid had cut Stuart's hair in this this kind of a French style, I think it was, with the hair forward. And then Paul copied, and then John copied. Of course, Pete Best didn't. And uh, they came back, and they had this new look, this totally new look. It was so exciting that the noise that came out of the Beatles was just, it like hit you in the chest. It was like a, a runaway train banging you in the chest, you know? It was just amazing. And it was that time, and I remember saying to the rest of the band, I said, you know, if anyone's going to make it in Liverpool, it's going to be the Beatles. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No doubt. Uh, time has proven that they are, for my money, they're the greatest songwriters, maybe ever. Their songs are still, they still stand the test of time. You know, what proves that, Steve, is that the the Beatles conventions that are all over the world at this time, and when you go to a Beatle convention, particularly in Liverpool, we've got anywhere between 40 and 60 tribute bands. Wow. Yeah. And they, they play in about eight to 10 different venues in Liverpool over a week, you know, between the Thursday and the following Tuesday, every August. And when you when you hear a band come from who has come from Russia, a Russian Beatles band. There's one called the Blitz Beatles. And they, they, we actually, when they were in Liverpool, we had them playing at, at the, the Beatles story, our replica cavern. And they're singing Love Me Do with a Liverpool accent. <laughs> you know, they couldn't, they couldn't speak English, or one, one of them could, and he learned his English from listening to Beatles records. Wow. The next day you'll see a band from Israel, a band from Brazil, from every country in the world. Um, I, I remember one convention, I, I was I com- as I said, I compared the event conventions. And on the Sunday, we had 12 bands back to back. So from 12 midday to midnight, one band every hour, all from different countries, not British bands, all different Beatle bands from all over the world. And there's a there's a Japanese Beatle band called the Parrots. And this guy, you know, these this this Japanese guy comes up to the microphone and he sings Mr. Moonlight. And it's John Lennon. <laughs> you know, he he sings Mr. You know, the, the introduction to Mr. Moonlight, you know, Mr. Moonlight. And he sounds like John. <laughs> so all right so how did we get from liverpool in the day where we've got the beatles and you're playing and so on how do we get up to the beatles becoming 
well, clearly they they went out and became massive worldwide phenomenon. And then you make a decision at some point that you want to be involved in Beatle City, right? Yes, Beatle City. Well, I, I, you know, rushing going forward from the 60s, at the end of the 60s, I um, I became what they call a cabaret singer. So I was doing, um, I changed I changed tack from beat groups and I was on the stage being Mr. Smooth, you know, singing Sinatra songs and um, Jack Jones and a very smooth type stuff, you know. And um, so I went through the 70s doing that. Then in the 80s, uh, well, the, the pivotal moment in the 80s was 1980 when John Lennon was murdered. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that was on the front page of every newspaper in the world, and our local newspaper, the Liverpool Echo, you know, John Lennon dead, and one of the promoters from the 60s, Sam Leach, he organised a massive vigil in the centre of town, and about 10,000 people turned out to the vigil in the centre of town in 1980, in December 1980. And um, if you like, that was the beginning of Beatles tourism. Prior to that, there was no actual Beatles tourism. No, there was no Beatles tourism in Liverpool at all, besides a very small, a couple of people, Liz and Jim Hughes, started something called Cavern Mecca. And it was in Matthew Street, and they, they, tried, they did a little Beatle convention, but it was all local. There was no international groups then. There were no tribute bands, just a local band. And there was no Beatle tourism. In fact, there was no tourism in Liverpool because we, we were a, a run-down city then. We were a very poor city. The docks had long since passed their sell-by date. Um, we had some, uh, we had a, a car manufacturer, which wasn't doing very well. The docks had fallen into disrepute. E everything was not so good. And we had a council who were militant, and uh, they were all for strikes, and they were against the central government. They didn't want to know central government. And so there was this clash between Liverpool Council and the national government. So we had a Labour militant government uh, council and, of course, a conservative government running the country. So there was this clash all the time. So Liverpool didn't have a chance. No one wanted to come to Liverpool in 1980. What then made you think that they could? Just after, because because of John's murder, that was that was the catalyst. The the pe from Americans, Japanese. You, I mean, you you had a Beatles fan club in America, in in Japan there was a a fifty thousand strong Japanese Beatles fan club, wow. and they started coming over to Liverpool in dribs and drabs. You know, ones and twos, ones and twos. Same with Americans; they would end up in Liverpool. And there was nowhere to there was nowhere to go really. You know, there was the cabin had closed. Matthew Street was a dead, dirty dump. Um, there was Penny Lane. There was Strawberry Fields, but there was there was nothing. You know, there was very little. There was very little music scenes in the eighties. But in nineteen eighty two, a small um, unit was opened in what. An alternative to the to the city council, we had a Merseyside County Council, and that co that covered Merseyside, so it was you know uh, out of Liverpool as well. And a small unit was started there, and I don't think it was called tourism. I, I don't know what it was called exactly, but it would be to do with arts and culture. But one of the guys in there, a guy called Ron Jones, he said to his boss. Um, can I try a Beatle weekend? And so and his boss said, yeah, go on, get on with it, Ron. And so Ron and his assistant, Pam, they started a Mersey Beatle weekend. And it was just inviting people from around the country to come to Liverpool. They would stay in a hotel for two days. They would have Beatle quiz and they'd get on a coach and Ron would give them a tour. And the next year, 1983, he put an advert in the Liverpool Echo saying Beatle Guides Wanted. And that's where Bernadette came along. Bernie said to me, <laughs> she said, have you seen this advert for Beatle Guides? I think I can do this. <laughs> so she applied. 
and of course because of her you know background in the cavern and at knowing the Beatles she got the job and, and she became a qualified Beatle guide and um, I was I was working for a newspaper at that time I, I was um, doing promotion promotion work I was I was running charity shows and she would come home every night after doing a Beatles tour saying, oh, we've had Americans today. Uh, I've had some Japanese. And it was big that and that was the beginning of Beatles tourism. So it had nothing to do with the city council who were still fighting our government, if you like, saying we want jobs. <laughs> we want houses. We don't want the Beatles. And so, you know, it was against all the odds. And um, um, but in 84, 1984, Beatles City opened. I had nothing to do with it when it opened. Uh, Bernadette, we went down there, so it. it was very nice, it, full of memorabilia, but it had no soul. It had no atmosphere. It wasn't an experience. It, there was, you know, John, John's guitar. There was um, uh, contracts. There was um, Ringo's Mini and motorcycle. There was some very nice memorabilia, amplifiers, um some of Brian Epstein's personal belongings. So it was it was like an exhibit of stuff. But it was a it was a museum. Like a know? museum. So it was more stand back and look at stuff. Look at stuff in glass cases. Right. So it failed. But by a chance, by a off chance, I was then running a, a garden festival, the events at the garden festival and became involved with Beatles City. And by a quirk of fate, I ended up being the manager of Beatles City, which at the time in 1986 was actually failing. It was fa it was failing. People weren't going. It was in the wrong place. It was at the wrong time. Uh, and as I say, it wasn't interactive and didn't appeal to non Beatle fans. So it was great for a real Beatle fan to go, wow, there's Ringo's Mini, there's John's guitar. But you need, for a tourist attraction to be successful, it's got to appeal to everybody. Anyway, so going forward, Bernie and I ended up in Dallas, Texas. Uh, I mean, the Bible Belt? <laughs> <laughs> no? Why? And the reason we went there was because one of the partners in the taking it there was um, South Fork Ranch. They were a partner. So we had the Beatles City, one third partner, the, uh, South Fork Ranch and the West End Marketplace where we where we built it. And uh, at the beginning, it was very, very successful. You know, 40,000 of your fellow Americans came to Dallas to see the exhibition and it was very successful. And Bernie was a big star there because she'd gone out with George Harrison, you know. So, so she was guiding, I was guiding and uh, we made, we, you know, it was... The actual exhibition was a success in Dallas. I thought, we thought it was coming back to Liverpool after the Dallas tour, but that wasn't going to happen. Was I mean, Liverpool was, wasn't ready for it at the time? No, it, it wasn't. It was nothing to do with Liverpool. It was to do with the the guy who had bought Beetle City. He hadn't. He didn't have any love for Liverpool, and he just wanted to make a quick book. He wasn't a Beatles fan. He just thought. I can take this around the world and make money. And he was so wrong. <laughs> because if he'd have tried to set it up anywhere else, Apple and the Beatles would have come down on him and said, you can't do that. So we went, we came back to Liverpool. Beatles City stayed in Dallas and eventually got sold off. It got split up. We came back to Liverpool in 1980, at the end of 87, with no job. Bernie, Bernie had a job because she could go straight back to guiding. So she was doing the Beatle guiding and she became a, a full tour guide. And by that time, I'd got the tourism book. I, I saw what was happening in Liverpool. And there was, despite our council, there was so much going on at the, at the Albert Dock. That was being redeveloped. That was being turned into a tourist attraction. So it Liverpool was starting to come out of the doldrums. It was coming out of the doldrums, yes. People still didn't want to live to visit Liverpool, you know. We were still seen as that uh, troubled city up north on the banks of the River Mersey with a militant council. 
So we in tourism, you know, people like Bernie and the Merseyside Tourism Board, we were fighting. It was like, you know, fighting against the Liverpool City Council. So we had to be independent. I mean, I remember going to this very big tourism fair in London. It was massive. It was called World Travel Market. So this was at the Earl's Court. And we ha- we were on the Liverpool stand, not, not Beatles stand at that time, Liverpool stand. And we could hear these southerners walking past our stand going, oh, Liverpool, who would want to go there? Liverpool had a terrible reputation. And it, it took us, honestly, it took us 20 years to actually change that perception. Today, Liverpool's fantastic, you know. But then it was we were we were working against <laughs> this attitude that Liverpool was awful, you know. So um so Bernie was being a beautiful guide. I came back from Dallas. I went to the tourism board, said, come on, we've got we've got to have a Beatle exhibition. And the tour, even the head of tourism, wasn't that he wasn't a Beatle fan, you know. So I um I I persisted and uh so I ended up on my own doing doing what they call a feasibility study on why be, why Liverpool needed a Beatle exhibition. So so you became essentially the person that was the driving you and Bernadette became the driving force behind making this happen. You yes. you became the champion of the property called the Beatles story. Yes, yes. We 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 were the only two the, there was another company who ran the Cavern Club. Cavern City Tours, so they were doing the convention, but they they didn't do anything besides that. They did they did tours and they did the convention and they had the cavern. And you um, were doing this without anybody's permission to do that. Without anyone's permission, without any money, we we had no money. We we did this feasibility study and then I turned it into a business plan. And I took this business plan to every bank, every inst- every financial institution, and everybody turned us down. Everybody turned me down. I mean, Bernie was doing the research. She she was writing the story that we were going to present in the Beatles story exhibition. I was out trying to get funding, and everybody turned us down. But I had a friend who actually said, I'll put £100,000 in. Nice. Because I, I, by that time, I was ready to give up, you know, because everyone had turned us down, even though we had a really good business plan. The business plan was was really good. All the figures stacked up, but no, no one would take a chance. So I always find this fascinating when someone sticks to it beyond where they think they can stick to something. You were ready to give up because... Everybody was saying, no, you're, we're not giving you money. We're not giving you a space, whatever they're not giving you. And you decided to stick it through. What, what was in you that said, I've got to see this through? I think it was my background in Liverpool. I think it was because I'd known the Beatles at the cabin, because I saw how phenomenal they were in the world. And I knew through Bernie and her touring that Liverpool needed a Beatle exhibition. And also, Steve, I think it was probably some kind of ignorance. <laughs> you know? Well, you know, Shakespeare once said, where ignorance is blissed, his folly to be wise. Yeah. And I, I'm, I, I believe that that must have been probably 50% of what drove me on was ignorance. And I thought... You know, even though people around me said, you can't do this, you won't get the money. I went, oh, yes, I will. Because one thing in my life, I've always liked a challenge. <laughs> I like a challenge. So my friend gave me, said, I'll give you £100,000. We had we only had £40,000 ourselves, which we borrowed from my dad. And my friend managed to get another £150,000. And I went to the, the English Tourist Board and got another £60,000. So we had £350,000 suddenly. So it was enough for me to go forward, go to the architects, go to the Albert Dock and say, right, I'm going to do a new Beatle exhibition. We need space. And I'd got some people behind me by then. and The architects were behind me, and they were talking to the Albert Dock company saying, this will work, this will be good. And so we had that. And then 
another bombshell when when we we decided we were having an experience you know these 18 features which would all be different and would they would have interactive stuff in them they would have audio visual there would be sounds there would be smells even you know we, we wanted to smell in matthew street because it was the fruit exchange we wanted a smell in the cabin which smelled like Ooh, smoke and uh, disinfectant. We wanted marijuana smell in the psychedelic era. <laughs> so when we decided we wanted all this special effects, someone said to me, ah, you can't do it for £350,000. You're going to need double that. Suddenly, I, ne I needed to find another £350,000, which I did find from uh, a, a national company, Wem Wembley Stadium, the people who ran the football stadium in London. The head of that was a scouser. Oh, yeah. He actually liked the business plan. So they put the rest of the money in. It is, so, correct uh, me if I'm wrong, it tends to be a little easier to get more money when you have a certain amount of money to start. Yes, you're, you're right. Because you can go to anybody then and say, well, I've got 350000 I've now got the backing of the tourism board. I've got the backing of a lot of other people in tourism and the English Tourist Board. That that was important to get their backing as well. So as you say, once you've got something, oh, you can go forward and, oh, yeah, okay. So, so all right, so now you're way down the road on this at this point. You have some amount of money that you know is going to help you get this thing started. Am I correct that at that moment you still didn't have rights from the Beatles? No, we didn't have any rights. So, so how did that work? How did you get those rights? What'd you do? Well, we, we are going. So I'm, I've suddenly raised all the money that we need. I've got the backing of the tourism board. Bernie is writing the story. And of course, she was then going to all the archive places, to the newspapers. She was going to the BBC film archive. She was going to the Granada in Manchester to, to find, just to source the film that we needed for the different features. And then the ugly word copyright read its ugly head. Yes. Hmm, okay. And then someone said, well, you're going to have to talk to Apple. And Apple, of course, in 1987, was run by Neil Aspinall. Neil Aspinall had been the Beatles' road manager and had gone, had been promoted to the head of Apple by 1980, 80, the mid-80s. He was then running Apple. And, of course, he had four masters. He had Yoko Ono, Paul McCartney, Ringo Starr, and George Harrison. Mm -hmm. The other thing that had happened, of course, was that they had sold their music to Michael Jackson. Right. Michael Jackson had the rights to the music. So suddenly we were presented with this, um, with this problem of getting in touch with each individual, with each um, with Michael Jackson's lawyers, with EMI, who ran part of the Beatles music, and um, Apple was the obvious one I had to get through to. So I wrote letters and faxes. We had fax machines then in those days. Oh, yes, no? yes. Uh, you, re you remember faxes? I, I remember faxes fondly. Yeah. So I was faxing everybody then um, and getting no replies from Apple at all. Uh, I found another guy who worked for, Steve, uh, for Neil. He was his right-hand man, Derek Taylor. And Derek was from Liverpool as well. And I sent him separately the synopsis of the Beatles story, how we were going to do it. And eventually I got a letter from Derek. Derek Taylor said... Meet me in London in the crypt of St. Martin's in the Field Church next Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Uh, you recognize me. I will have the Guardian newspaper under my arm. Well, it sounds like a spy meeting. It was. It was. <laughs> I'm, I'm going, you know, I, I'm this, you know, kind of ordinary guy in Liverpool who was a, you know, musician. I, I am not a rich guy. I'm not a finance guy. I'm not the. I'm not a, the head of a 
you know, a company or anything. I'm just this guy who, who's got this dream of opening an exhibition. So, and, and, and also, we didn't have much, we didn't have any money. <laughs> so, so anyway, so I get the train. I go to London. I go to St Martin's in the Field. I sit down with Derek Taylor, and he says, "Okay, tell me what you want to do." I said, "Well." We had Beatles City. Beatles City failed. So he said, why do you think you will make it work? I said, because it's going to be completely different. It's going to be an experience. This is my business plan. Gave him the business plan. And he said, OK, I'll read it. and I'll give it to I'll, I'll talk to Neil. Now, you can imagine Neil Aspinall at this time. He was dealing with John's estate, Paul, Ringo and George. He doesn't want to know about a new museum in Liverpool, a new exhibition. He doesn't want to know. But I am so determined that I I just kept writing and ringing and calling. And eventually, you know, Derek Taylor must have said, this guy's not going to go away. <laughs> you better meet him. And so I got a meeting with, with uh, Neil. And the first thing he said to me was, we don't want you to do this. <laughs> <laughs> you you know persistence is everything isn't it it really is you know i it was like um you know i had this bit between my teeth and i i've got bernadette at home who is doing all the research and she's she's working so hard at it um my kids are going go on dad carry on <laughs> carry on the kid my ali ali and matthew they were they were made up that we were doing this because they they could do what they wanted because we never saw them. <laughs> but anyway, I digress. So Neil Aspinall said, "I don't want you to do this." And I said, "Why?" And he said, "Well, if it fails like Beatles City did," he said, "I get the blame." I said, "Why do you get the blame?" He said, "Because anything that goes wrong in Beatle world." I get the blame. Paul doesn't. Ringo doesn't. He said, I get the blame. The newspapers ring Neil Aspinall and say, why has Paul done this? Why has Yoko done that? He said, so if, Be if your Beatles story fails, I all the newspapers think that I've set it up, not you. So I get all the blame. So I said, well, I'm sorry about that, Neil, but I'm going to do it. I said, I don't think you can stop me. He said, he said we probably could. We could probably stop you having the music. I could anyway. I think Derek Taylor said to Neil, "This guy knows what he's doing. He's going to do it right. He's got the right venue." And that was the, that was a very big thing having the Albert Dock, because the Albert Dock by then was getting millions of visitors a year. Well, that so makes a it, big difference, doesn't it? Yeah, it was already a tourism attraction. How did you decide to put into it what you put into it? How did you decide it's going to be 18 exhibit areas? How did you make those decisions? Well, Bernadette and I just sat down at home every night, every day, drawing this idea and writing down what was most important. I mean, I mean, the other the other exhibition didn't have the background. We wanted the background, so our first two features had nothing to do with the Beatles. They were to do with Liverpool and how Liverpool was when the Beatles were born. So the first part, the first piece was an audio visual thing showing Liverpool in the 1940s, the war years, uh, the, the war damage on the streets. And it, it opened with Liverpool, the birthplace of the Beatles, you know, and it showed the background to Liverpool. Then the next feature was the influences on the Beatles. So Elvis, Buddy Holly, uh, Bill Haley. By the time the tourist, you know, the visitor had got to the third feature, they were already immersed back in 1940s, 1950s, 1960s Liverpool. And that was the whole idea. So you went, and, and one of the other big things that we did, so important, was soundproofing between these 18 features. So when I was working with the architects, we brought sound specialists in so that there would be a sound barrier between every feature because we had have, we have sound in every feature. So I didn't want sound bleeding 
from one feature to the next. Well, that so, makes sense because it would suddenly become a big mishmash. Yeah. So so we would have in one section, you know, the second section was the influence. You'd, you'd have Bill Haley's Rock Around the Clock playing, but you'd go through a sound section. You were suddenly in Hamburg, Hamburg Street, with the sounds, German voices coming through the speakers in the background, Pobbles, the Star Club entrance, and coming from the Star Club entrance was the Beatles recording from, from Hamburg, you know, in 19, 60, 1961. So each section was, we, we were so adamant about this sound not, le not bleeding. And it worked, you know. So you walked out of Hamburg and you went back into Liverpool into a Mersey Beat office. So what, Hamburg had real cobbles on the floor. You know, we, we didn't have any, what do they call them, baffled walls, uh, wooden walls. Everything was brick. Everything was solid. So you could you could keep the sound separated. To keep the sound, but also to make people think, I'm walking out of a Hamburg street. Oh, but I'm walking back the next section. I'm walking into an office. You feel like you're really on a street. Yeah, exactly. Oh, you, you did, because out of the office... You went into Matthew Street, and the whole thing felt and sound like a miniaturized street. And it was, it, it was, we had sound effects, we had the mock grapes pub, and then you had the entrance to the cavern in the, this whole thing, and sound effects. When Bernadette and I used to go to the cavern in the 60s, in 1960s, I would walk down Matthew Street from my dad's shop, and I could hear this boom, 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 coming from the entrance of the cavern. Bernadette used to come the other way. I, we didn't know each other then. She was coming from her the shop where she worked. She was a hairdresser. She was coming up the street, and she would hear the same thing going up the street, this boom, boom. And so when we built the Beatles story and we built Matthew Street, we had a subwoofer speaker behind a facade and it ju you could just hear this, boom, boom, boom. and it was it was the bass from Twist and Shout. All you heard was the bass. That's all we wanted to hear because you know you wanted people to know that it was that that's what you were coming up to, and that's what you that's what you would hear. You know, that's phenomenal. Um, so all right, let's talk for a moment uh, about the book that you've published, The Birth of the Beatles Story. It is a wonderful telling of the creation of the exhibition, and it really focuses on how you put this whole thing together. And anyone that's interested in how one puts together a massive exhibition like you did, it's very instrumental and also very well written and very entertaining. Um, why did you decide at this time to compile and publish this book? Um, for over the years, Steve, people had said to us, why don't you write a book? And and it was for different reasons, not just because we'd done the Beatles story, because of my background in all the entertaining I'd done. I'd you know I'd done gone through the cabaret years. I'd done theatre. I'd worked with a lot of big you know British stars and things like that. People said, "Why didn't you write a book?" And we go, "No, we haven't got a book." But we felt we felt it was right, the right time. We had enough material at last to write an interesting book. And, um, and it, it had to be pointed out to us, <laughs> we, you know. And Well, that's your modesty. You're modest about it, but somebody realized you had something to say. Yeah, but you, you mentioned um, a guy called Tim Quinn, who, who became a friend of ours. And before. who's been on Storybeat. Tim Quinn has been an, on an episode of Storybeat. Yes. And so we met Tim, we knew Tim, and Tim had interviewed me about the Beatles story, and then he said he didn't know about our background playing at the cabin and Bernadette going out with George and Paul and, and seeing the birth of Beatlemania, which she did. So um, he, he heard about this and he went, Mike, you know, he encouraged us to write the book. He said, you've got so much material. You've got the early years. And, of course, the great thing, which we, all, we always laugh about, is that Bernadette is a hoarder. She kept stuff. A good thing, huh? Thank God. Thank God. We we thank God now that she kept all her bits and pieces. Uh, you know, and 
in the book, of course, you will have seen the actual note that George Harrison wrote to her after he'd been met her at Rory's. You know, the actual note is there. Well, that and, and all the autographs they gave her. And... The autographs. And, and another lovely piece of memorabilia she has is a handbag which which she'd take had at the cavern and they were signing this is after love me do came out and she said i've got nothing to sign and the beatles said oh what about your handbag and you know so the signatures are on the inside of it's a handbag. it's a great picture of that in the book too yes yeah so so we've we've got all this in the book and then of course the third section of the book is the actual beatles story with the, the early pictures before it was finished, halfway through the finish, and the actual finished object. And one of the things we were very determined to do was create recreate a replica cavern. And our cavern is very, very close to the original. That's, uh, you know, I haven't been over there, but I really would like to see it because it looks fabulous and fascinating. Is there a specific part of the exhibition that you think is your favorite that you like more than any other? Our, our favorite piece of the exhibition was the White Room. Mm, the White Room. The White Room. And of course, that was our tribute to John. And again, it was one of the main features that we had to get right. Uh, we wanted to get Matthew Street right. We wanted to get the replica cavern right. We wanted to get the psychedelic era, the octopus's garden and the yellow submarine right. But probably the most important one to get right was the White Room. And because we, we wanted to do, because John had been murdered, we wanted to do a tribute, a proper tribute to John. We didn't have space to do the solo years justice. We didn't have the money and we didn't have the space to do that because most of the money had gone, you know, on the rest of the exhibition. And the Beatles themselves are a massive thing to cover in the first place. Well, well, yes, yes. Um, the exhibition now has, a, they took more space and that's been uh, rectified. But when we were, when we built, you know, in 1990, so we, we did this small solo area with just very minimal nod to Paul, George and Ringo. But we, we got a space. Uh, a whole section which we um made for john the white room and that was that was the most soundproofed in the whole exhibition mm. and we, we recreated you know the the imagine video with the white piano the white carpet the the windows behind we replicated the windows we had net curtains which which just swayed there was so there was a fan out of sight the fan moved and we had a special lighting effect so as the lights went down and imagine started playing so you walked into the white room totally soundproofed imagine would start playing a spotlight came on a photograph of john on the white piano and it played through and the background you had the the curtains swaying and that was the last feature in the exhibition. And the, the visitors would come out of the exhibition into the shop crying. That uh, you had an emotional, cathartic experience going through that room. Oh, totally emotional. And and for us who who heard it every day, it still was emotional for us when we, we went through. When we went through the White Room, you know, particularly when it was quiet, and we would stand in the, and it, it just, the, the hairs would rise on the back of my neck, you know? How long did it take you to finish the book? How long did it take you to put it all together? About three years. Oh, that was a long time. Yes, yes. Because again, it, <laughs> our daughter, Alison, helped me write a lot of the book. Bernadette and I had the early part, but our stories, you know, the cabin and all that. But the middle section of going to Beetle City and Dallas and all that, Ali did a lot of research on that. And she did a lot of research on the final part, the actual bill. So she and I did a lot of the, you know, the writing for that, that part. And Bernadette had done all the writing for the first part. Um, so It's, you know, it's we, very well written, Mike. 
book is beautifully written and it's beautifully well, put together. I hope it is. I hope it's an interesting read. And it, it does, and it all it tells a story of Liverpool, Liverpool's attitude to the Beatles as well in the early days. Oh, indeed. It's a, you cover the whole gamut from the beginning of the Beatles and prior to the Beatles, really, uh, in Liverpool, and then up through the Beatles themselves, and then, of course, covering how the exhibition comes together. But yes. it, it's a very comprehensive in that way, and it's it's wonderful to read, and it's really great to see all of the uh, many different pictures that are in the book. How long did it take you to assemble all those images? Was mo were most of those in your collection, or did you have to go seek elsewhere for? for well, that? well, the the flyers and the tickets uh, were in our collection. Again, Bernie had kept them all, being the the wonderful hoarder she is. <laughs> <laughs> and then we did a lot of archive. Al Ali is a great researcher, and she went into archives all over the world to find certain things that we needed. And again, the copyright thing kept coming up all the time because everybody, you know, people like Getty and Al Alamy, is it? They've all, and Apple, have all brought anything to do with Beatles. I mean, but any collection, any photographer's collection of Beatles stuff is now owned mostly by Apple. Right. You know, they when they were when they were doing the anthology, they made it their mission to buy everything they could and own it. They want to own everything. Was the fact that you had in place a deal with them did that make it easier for you to obtain permission? Yes, yes, because we we were allowed to do the pictures that we had produced in the exhibition, so that was okay as long as we didn't do anything else. Um, and luckily, we had a friend in Liverpool. Uh, a, a lady called Margaret Roberts who went to the cavern in the original days, friend, who was a friend of ours, and her boss took a lot of photographs, the, the Peter Kay collection. And so we were allowed to use her pictures as well with no charge at all. So that, that was great. Um, and we found we, we didn't have to pay for many pictures at all because we had it. And, and as you've seen in the book, there's over 200 pictures illustrations and flyers from the time well and a lot of them were your own personal things and our personal stuff yeah yeah that that's fabulous uh, i've been having just a terrific wonderful interesting conversation about the a birth of the beatles story with mike byrne who's uh, coming to us from liverpool and I, i'm just wondering in all of your experiences with this do you have a story that you could share with us that's either weird quirky, offbeat, strange, or just plain funny? Well, um, there's a couple of stories if you've got time, Steve. Sure, sure. One is from my very first professional band called We Were Them Grimbles. And uh, we weren't a beat group like the Beatles. It was a six-piece. It was semi-jazzy. I was doing Ray Charles stuff, Mose Allison, you know, Nina Simone. We were doing slightly, you know, a bit jazzy. We had a, we had a sax and, uh, and a Hammond organ. And our trip to, that was the band that we took to Germany. The night we were going to Germany, we had a gig in Liverpool, and we, we had a converted ambulance to take all the gear. You would imagine that our road manager would be completely on top of everything, or everything prepared to get us to Germany. We drove out of Liverpool and ran out of petrol oh. in <laughs> we fixed that got to birmingham and the wheel fell off the van oh wow the wheel so, fell off the van yeah the wheel fell off so that was that was one crazy thing that happened and then moving on to when we went to dallas we, we had to beetle city was in liverpool and we were running it at the time we had 10 days to pack it so we packed the whole of Beatles City into 10 very big crates. These crates were shipped to Dallas. I think, I don't know where they arrived, maybe Galveston, somewhere on the Texas, and then got, they were taken to Dallas. Anyway, my great memory of that was unpacking these cases. And most of the stuff, we were, the, the exhibition was on the fourth floor of the West End Marketplace. 
to get most of the stuff in the service lift except Ringo's Mini. <laughs> Ringo's Mini was carried up the escalators by 14 workmen. Oh, wow. And that was a that was one of my overriding, you know, my image from Dallas is these workmen handballing Ringo's Mini up an escalator. <laughs> Did anybody take a picture of that? No, no. Would you believe we haven't got a picture of it? Uh, Incredible. Another crazy thing. I think. I mean, this is this is embarrassing, really. When when we were when we came back from Dallas, we went to the tourism board, and I think I mentioned earlier that the, the head of tourism they weren't very big Beatle fans, and the head of tourism I overheard in front of other people, actually say, well, the Beatles are rubbish. <laughs> that was the head of tourism. Oh, my goodness. So you, you can imagine what we were like, you know, what we were like. That was, that was the background to what Bernadette and I had to work against. You know, it was against all the odds. Well, as we as we mentioned earlier, this is about being persistent to see your goal through because you believe in it yourself. We we believe we believed in it a hundred and fifty percent. That's plain to see that you were really deeply invested in this uh, project, and and obviously it turned out extremely well. Last question for you today, Mike. Um, I'm just wondering. You've already given us a great deal of information to chew on and a lot of really interesting stuff to think about in terms of advice and and how you would put something together. But can you lend a solid piece of advice or a tip for someone who is just starting out trying to do what you've done, or maybe they're working it a little bit and or trying to make it happen? Do you have a piece of advice for them? You know, you've got to believe in yourself you've got to believe in your dream and it's always great if you've got a partner like bernadette behind you saying okay let's have a go let's keep going because i have to say in the first in the early days when i first came home and said we're going to do it ourselves she didn't believe it and she said we can't do this we haven't got any money but once we started and i did the business plan it was great to have Bernadette 100% behind me. And my family. Uh, it's great to have your family behind you and friends. So you, you need to share your dream with other people because you can't do it on your own. That's really wise you know? and smart advice. You You do need, in almost all cases, you need others to eventually be involved. Even if you're a solo act, even if you are a solo singer or songwriter, even if you're an artist, even if you're a writer, at some point you need other people. Oh, you do need other people. And one one other big guy who helped me was our architect. The architect who helped me, helped us design it. We, we would sometimes, we would go home after working at the exhibition, you know, all day, all day, eight days a week. Um, <laughs> eight days a week. We would think, we'd think of something to change, you know, and we'd go back the next day to the architect and say, look, you know the Hamburg feature? Can you make it two feet bigger? And, you know, most people would go, no, you can't change that. This guy would go, yes, yes, we can do that. And he'd sit down and he'd redraw the plan and give it to the builders. You know, so so we had, we when we got started, we had lots of people helping us in the background and going, yes, yes, yes. And, you know, even people like Charles then, you know, we, the P, our Beatle friends. We're talking now about Charles Rosenay. Is our yeah, mutual Charles, friend? He, he is, he's still a good friend of ours. In fact, we were with Charles just before Christmas in Florida. And, and a great guy he is. And he has been a guest on this show. And he's a, one of the most interesting people I've ever met. And, and he is so generous with his time and his encouragement. Well, and that's, you also need that too, don't you? Because if everybody's down on you, there's, it gets harder and harder, but you do need people to, to support you and tell you what you're doing is on the right path and to keep you going, uh, if nothing else, morally and emotionally. Yes. Mm, yeah. And, and we, we had that, 
with a certain amount of people, we had that encouragement and that support. And that's that's what got us through it. And, you know, determination and, and a good idea. Well, and, that, that you definitely had. Uh, yeah. Mike Byrne, this has been an absolutely spectacular hour plus on Storybeat today. And I cannot thank you enough for spending a little time with me and sharing your experiences in developing the, uh, the Birth of the Beatles story with the, my listeners today. So thank you so much. Oh, thank you, Steve. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. And so we've come to the end of today's Storybeat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great StoryBeat episodes to you. StoryBeat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.